My name is Anna Abram. I'm co-principal of the Margaret Beaufort Institute of Theology. And my role today, apart from welcoming you, is to say a few words about the Institute, this event and the speaker. So the Institute, established in 1993, is the only Roman Catholic member of the Cambridge Theological Federation. The Federation is a body of 11 institutions representing different Christian denominations and one interfaith institute. We offer courses in theology and its allied disciplines to students of all levels, doctoral, masters, diplomas and certificates. We lead workshops, enrichment events, retreats and seminars. Our academic staff, a small team of four, as well as a growing community of research associates and fellows, currently 21 of them, undertake research in areas within theology, spirituality, philosophy, ethics, ethnography, technology and pastoral practice exploring themes that range from music and meaning making through aging to restorative justice. The Institute is home to the Religious Life Institute and we collaborate with three on-site partners, Linz House, Kirby Lang Center for Public Theology and Cambridge Center for Applied Research in Human Trafficking. Amongst our public events, the Mary Ward Lecture is the most significant. It was inaugurated in 1997 and was named after one of the most is inspiring and courageous women. Mary Ward was a 16th century Catholic nun whose activities led to the founding of the Congregation of Jesus and the Institute of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Her legacy, which is to advance the intellectual, moral and spiritual education of women, informs much of the Institute's work. Our previous Mary Ward lectures were given by such eminent speakers as Professor Mary McAleese, Professor Janet Soskis, Professor Elizabeth Johnson, Dr. Gemma Simmons, Right Reverend Timothy Radcliffe, Professor John Cottingham and Professor Luz Irigaray. Before I introduce Fiona, let me mention a couple of practical points. So first, can I please ask you to click the mute button on your screens during the lecture? And if you think that you would concentrate better on the lecture if your camera, camera is switched off, please feel free to do so, whatever suits you best. There will be a handout accompanying the lecture, which hopefully you will be able to see on your screen. After the lecture, there will be a short break and it will be followed by question and answers session chaired by Dr. Uh, Ferdia Stone Davies, our director of research. So now a few words about our speaker. Fiona Ellis is professor of philosophy of religion and founder and director of the Center for Philosophy of Religion. Fiona is based at Roehampton University. Before Roehampton, she worked at Heathrop College for 12 years, and this is where I had the privilege to get to know Fiona and be inspired by her thinking and teaching. She taught a course called LSD and God, full title is Love, Sex, Death and God. And this course was one of the most popular modules at Heathrop. Many of us were quite envious of that module because she always had most students on it. We shared many great moments infused with caffeine in the lovely cafes of Kensington and a lot of laughter. Fiona, you might be surprised, but I still have a pair of false, false eyelashes that you gave me before that difficult meeting I had to chair at Heathrow. Before Heathrow, Fiona had lectureships at Wadham College, Oxford and Queen's College, Oxford. Fiona has directed a number of international research projects her current Templeton project is entitled Naturalism and Supernaturalism Beyond the Divide. She has published widely in the area of philosophy of religion, the relation between philosophy and theology, naturalism and the philosophy of love and desire. Amongst her monographs, God, Value and Nature, 
published by Oxford University Press in 2014, earned Fiona an international recognition and high acclaim. One reviewer describes Fiona as one of the most significant voices in philosophy of religion today. Fiona, we are most grateful to you for accepting our invitation to deliver this lecture on the topic meaning of life, God and desire. And we are very much looking forward to listening to you. Thank you, over to you. Thank you so much, Anna. And am I speaking at the right volume for everybody? Um, everybody can hear me, so that's, that's quite good. And there's going to be a handout appearing on the screen in a little while. I just want to say thank you, Anna, for your friendship and inspiration. And thanks also to the many friends who are in the audience today and who've been part of the work that I've been doing for a long time, particularly David McPherson and John Cottingham. And I don't think I'd have got um, where I am now without, without um, those people. And many others too. So I'm going to be um, reading this lecture so that it can be vaguely coherent and Sue's going to put the handout on the screen and it's not a really long handout but it'll just give you a map of where I'm going and will perhaps make it a bit easier um, given that we're doing this on Zoom. Now um, hang on a moment, exit full screen so that I can get my lecture up here. Uh, okay, I'm ready to go. So the title of the lecture is Meaning, Desire and God, and there's a subtitle, um, An Expansive Naturalist Approach. So I'm beginning here um, with the introduction on the handout. The question of the meaning of life is finally and justifiably a hot topic in analytic philosophy and in analytic philosophy of religion too. The relevant approaches to this topic tend to fall into one of two categories, depending upon whether the philosopher in question is sympathetic to atheism or to theism. The atheist approach is naturalistic and immanentist. Her focus is the meaning in life, and as John Cottingham has recently put it, she rejects any sense that life as a whole might be measured against some overall standard goal or transcendent structure. The theist takes this latter step, but her position is often set out in terms which make the atheistic option seem infinitely preferable. So, for example, theism is often said to involve the introduction of a spiritual dimension, such as heaven, which transcends the realm of nature. And God is often reduced to a transcendent thing or person, who becomes a kind of managing director, issuing purposes from the beyond. As Tim Mawson has put it, in the context of defending a position along these lines, we are working for someone else rather than being self-employed. My issue with this position is not just that it turns God into an easily removable supernatural entity so that we can focus upon life in the here and now, but it says very little or nothing about the transformative love involving relations, which according to Christian doctrine, are central to God's essence and to what it means to be part of God's life. On either of the disputed pictures then, whether atheist or theist, the natural and the supernatural are dualistically opposed. I want to explore a strategy which poses a radical challenge to these terms of debate and which narrows the gap between the relevant warring factions. First, I defend a, poor, a form of naturalism which exceeds the limits of the more orthodox scientific naturalism, where science is the measure of everything, and which promises to accommodate a spiritual dimension. I've called this position expansive or liberal naturalism. It bears some resemblance to Iris Murdoch's true naturalism, and it grants us the right to say, with Murdoch, that, quote, as moral beings, we are immersed in a reality which transcends us, and that moral progress consists in awareness of this reality and submission to its purposes. The difference is that I want to make a case for comprehending this reality in God-involving terms. 
So naturalism is no longer opposed to theism on my position, and it's to be distinguished from most analytic philosophy and philosophy of religion in this respect. Second, and this is a further distinguishing feature, the notion of desire in all its complexity is a key ingredient in my approach to the question of life's meaning. A desire solution to the problem of life's meaning is defended by Richard Taylor in his 1970 book, Good and Evil. However, Taylor operates within the offending framework, one in which the natural is dualistically opposed to the supernatural. I shall spell out what a desire solution could look like when set out from within a theistic naturalist framework and argue that there are good reasons for taking this approach seriously. So we're now moving on to section two, Taylor on meaning. Taylor accepts the value denuded world of the scientific naturalist, describing the world as a vast machine feeding on itself, running on and on forever to nothing. He includes human life in its ambit and takes the endless stone rolling of Sisyphus as an image for such existence. Nothing comes of it nothing at all. This, for Taylor, is what it means for life to be objectively meaningless, and he considers what could be added to make it meaningful. The relevant labours might be said to have a point if something came of them, using the stones to build a temple, for example. This would give them a direction and a purpose, and Taylor contends that it's easy to suppose that our own lives have a kind of purpose, and that the world which lies before us is the work of a benevolent creator. He has no illusions along these lines, but finds it unsurprising that we invent ways of denying the sober truth. Hence, quote, our religions proclaim a heaven that does not crumble. Their hymns and prayer books declaring a significance to life of which our eyes provide no hint whatsoever and our philosophies portray some permanent and lasting good at which all may aim. Such frameworks are said to go hand in hand with the idea of a final state, one akin to what Sisyphus would have, quote, when the last obstacle is removed and the last stone pushed to the hilltop. Taylor adds that no one really believes that any such state will be final or even wants it to be the case sorry, or even wants it to be, in case it means that human existence would then cease to be a struggle. Taylor's awful lending emphasis to our eternal struggle and unquenchable spirit, as he puts it. And this paves the way to his own preferred solution to the problem of life's meaning. According to this approach, we're to forget about direction, purpose, and final states, and suppose instead that the gods, quote, while condemning Sisyphus to the fate just described, at the same time as an afterthought waxed perversely merciful by implanting in him a strange and irrational impulse, namely a compulsive impulse to roll stones. It counts as perverse in the sense that there's clearly no reason why anyone should have a persistent and insatiable desire to do something so pointless as that, unquote. Yet it's also merciful, given, given that Sisyphus has been given his heart's desire. He can go on rolling stones forever. What goes for Sisyphus goes for us too. For what makes the crucial difference is, quote, our own wills, our deep interest in what we find ourselves doing. Taylor concludes that, quote, the meaning of life is to be found from within us. It's not bestowed from without and it far exceeds in both its beauty and permanence any heaven of which men have ever dreamed or yearned for. He adds also that we get to avoid a genuine hell. This is the infinite boredom to which we would be subject if our struggles came to an end, our desires were satisfied, and we attained the aforementioned final state. Taylor's claims and assumptions here can be contested. The idea of the world as a vast machine can be variously interpreted, but it's compatible with the scientific naturalist position and certainly rules out any suggestion of an interventionist God. 
This latter consequence is to be applauded, but it does nothing to undermine the truth of theism and scientific naturalism is open to question in any case. As for the idea that our eyes provide no hint that reality has any religious significance, we need to be clear about what such evidence could amount to. Assuming that it's not a matter of seeing a bearded man in the sky performing magical tricks and that love and goodness are key in this context, we could respond that the evidence is all around us. Taylor objects that religion's heaven is no more than a form of hell. It counts as such in the sense that it involves being in a state in which desires are extinguished and activity terminated. This objection presupposes that we have a clear sense of the nature and limits of heavenly existence and that it involves the death of the unquenchable spirit, which for Taylor makes life worth living in the first place. Such a complaint is familiar from Nietzsche and atheists more generally, and it goes hand in hand with the idea that religion is anti-life and nihilistic. Quote, God as the declared aversion to life, the canonization of the will to nothingness, as Nietzsche puts it. These complaints have a point if the religious is to be set apart from the spiritual, the natural and the human, but this framework can be contested. That is to say, the theist will say that we are receptive to the spiritual at the level of our natural human being and that the unquenchable spirit at issue here has religious significance. But where does this leave the notion of heavenly existence, something which surely does stand opposed to our natural human being, assuming that it becomes available to us only once we die? Certainly it's not available to us in its full glory, yet once it's denied that the dimension at issue here is closed off from anything to which we could relate in the here and now, then we can allow that intimations of this reality are possible and that we have sight of it in this respect. As John McDade once said, perhaps we are already deep in heaven. I want to argue that we're receptive to these intimations at the level of loving desire. And I shall be spelling out some of the details of this approach in due course. First though, I need to address the atheist's worry that I'm paving the road to Taylor's hell in this context. It's the task of the following section to allay this worry and to begin to make a case for claiming that the real threat of hell comes from Taylor's own position. So I'm moving now to section three, meaning and desire. According to Taylor's solution, the meaning of life is to be found from within us at the level of desire. Desire in this context being an irrational and insatiable impulse, which keeps us engaged with the business of living. It's irrational in the sense that the activity, activities it motivates us to pursue are pointless. It's insatiable in the sense that it never gives out. Such a position is consonant with Taylor's metaphysics. Reality is to be comprehended in non-evaluative terms. Desire is reduced to a mysteriously induced impulse. And there's no room for the kind of desire taken seriously by the Platonist and the theist. Desire in this latter sense involves being attracted to an independent source of value. And although it's no part of such a picture that we are invariably moved in this direction, it's allowed that some of the conflicts within our desires are capable of resolution and that they can be redirected and transformed in this respect. We have here a possible evaluation of desire, one which proceeds with reference to something beyond desire and which grants us the right to say that there are things which are good to pursue and which we have reason to pursue and to desire and things which are not. Goodness in this context can be as complex and multifaceted as it needs to be. It is inclusive of an individual's good and the good more generally. And, it, and it's central to the question of life's meaning, assuming that such a life involves being engaged with worthwhile projects and pursuits. Taylor agrees that a meaningful life involves being engaged with one's projects and pursuits taking the crucial ingredient to be found at the level of, quote, our own wills 
our deep interest in what we find ourselves doing. Yet his identification of such interest with an irrational impulse leaves no room for the idea that its pursuit could be more or less worthwhile. To return to Sisyphus, there's no answer to the question of why he should want to engage in stone rolling. And to return to human life more generally, our supposedly deep interest in what we find ourselves doing becomes equally mysterious. The further implication even supposing that we could get over the difficulty of explaining why we should care about anything at all, is that there is no more to a meaningful existence than what we happen to want to do, desire in this context being reducible to a disposition to follow the dictates of an irrational impulse. Thad Metz agrees in a recent book that this kind of subjectivism is problematic. He quotes Susan Wolfe's claim that meaning arises when subject, subjective attraction meets objective attractiveness and suggests that an objectivist solution along these lines is the best hope for a naturalist and the strongest challenge to one who thinks that a spiritual condition is necessary for life's meaning. The spiritual here is, note, is identified with the religious and as you'll see, is distinguished from the natural. I agree that we should be moving in an objectivist direction, but I've denied that the spiritual and the natural are to be opposed in this manner and have taken seriously the idea that a position in which these elements are unified could be compatible with theism. We know from Taylor, however, that a theistic approach could be interpreted as a covert way of undermining the very point of a desire solution to life's meaning. For it might be thought to suggest that what really matters in this context is the attainment of a final state in which desire is satisfied once and for all. A final state which Taylor associates with hell. Taylor associates this picture with hell because it brings the death of desire, and he takes desire to be the key ingredient in a meaningful life. It should be clear from what I've said that the religious framework is not invariably antithetical to desire and hence life. And according to the position I have de I've been developing, it's that in terms of which we are attracted to the moral and the spiritual sorry, desire is that in terms of which we're attracted to the moral and the spiritual. Such attraction being a central component of what it is to lead a suitably meaningful life. Taylor cannot make sense of there being desire in this sense. He takes it to point in the direction of an otherworldly and non-existent realm. And such a framework would appear to spell the death of desire not simply because we're no longer around to enjoy the relevant state, we're dead, but because even if we were around, desire would have been eradicated. Taylor's main concern then is to defend the endless recurrence of the irrational impulse he puts in place of desire in this sense. Now it's futile at one level to speculate about the nature of the relevant final state, but I've taken seriously the idea that intimations of the reality it involves are available in the here and now, and that we're attracted to this reality at the level of desire. Taylor assumes that such desire is aimed ultimately at its own extinction, as if it's reducible to a lack which demands to be filled. But this is not the only way of comprehending such desire, this kind of religious desire. And there's a very different tradition of thinking in Platonist and theistic discussions, which is highly significant for our purposes and implicit in some of what has been said already. According to this approach, desire for the good or for God or for God has nothing to do with wanting to fill oneself up and everything to do with being attracted away from the self towards a reality of supreme value and inexhaustible depth. This movement has the effect of expanding desire rather than contracting it as the subject becomes filled with love 
for something whose goodness has no bounds. Emmanuel Levinas says of such desire that it is, quote, not an appeal for food, that it desires beyond anything that can simply complete it, and that its object serves to hollow out the desire rather than to fill it. Quote, the true desire is that which the desired does not satisfy, but hollows out. He claims also that this desire is expressed in our loving relations to others, and that it is at this level of interaction that we relate authentically to God. Levinas talks of our giving expression to the infinite in this context, distinguishing such a position from one in which the infinite is in front of me. Desire in this sense has an unquenchable life, and its life is drawn from the inexhaustible source to which the subject is oriented by virtue of desiring in this way. Aquinas expresses the point by saying that, quote, the more perfectly the so sovereign good is possessed, the more it is loved and other things despised. Hence it is written, they that eat me shall yet hunger. Levinas claims in similar vein that such desire nourishes itself with its hunger. So we have here a challenge to the idea that religious desire is aimed at its own extinction and a clear paradigm of what it could mean for there to be endless desire. At one level then, this picture suits Taylor's purposes perfectly. In another sense, of course, it does no such thing, for it involves a commitment to the very things he's determined to avoid and to replace. God, an independent notion of goodness, heaven, etc. Now it's worth emphasizing at this point that nothing has been said to rule out Platonism or theism, nor are we forced to accept that these positions involve a neglect of the natural world and our natural human being in favour of some supernatural realm. On the contrary, as I've spelled it out, they offer the resources for expanding the limits of the natural and taking us beyond the sparse ingredients to which we're confined on Taylor's approach. Taylor's beings have an endless desire to do whatever they're doing, but we're given no sense that their lives proceed with reference to any kind of evaluative structure or direction. It's all just endless repetition. Indeed, there's a real question of how the desire which motivates the relevant activity is sustained. Taylor helps himself to the idea of a mysterious, irrational impulse implanted by the gods. And although this metaphor makes some sense when applied to the biologically determined impulses we find within ourselves and over which we have no control, e.g. hunger and thirst, it makes no sense of the desires at issue when we're concerned with the task of being human, or properly human. These desires cannot be reduced to irrational impulses. They operate within the space of practical reason, and our attraction in this context has a particular direction towards the values which are responsible for eliciting the desires in the first place. The desires of Taylor's subjects have no such direction, and there's a real question of what it is that keeps them going. The philosopher Mark Platz has gone so far as to claim that in such a scenario, the value of what I'm motivated to do is reduced to the fact that I want to do it, and that if value reduces to desire in this way, then desire will come to an end. If there's a difficulty here, and I'm not suggesting that we have to accept this conclusion, but if there's a difficulty here, then Taylor's subject's unquenchable spirit is in question. I'm coming now to the final section for moving ahead. Well, there's only two or three lines on your handout anyway. <clears throat> so 
There's neither time nor space to argue for this final claim in any detail, the worry or the claim that perhaps um, Taylor's desiring subject is such that the, the desire here cannot be sustained. But the tentative conclusions at which I've arrived have enormous significance, not just for the question of whether Taylor's subjectivism can be made good, but for an understanding assess and assessment of the more general problem of nihilism, itself a view about the meaning of life. The nihilist judges that everything is meaningless, as Nietzsche puts it. Now, the problem of nihilism, as we know, is set out by Nietzsche in the face of the supposed death of God. Its interpretation is both complex and contentious. And I want to end this lecture by speculating how it might be linked to the themes of today's lecture. Sorry. <laughs> when, when Nietzsche's madman bemoans the death of God, he worries that we've lost any center of significance or focus or orientation. He says that the earth has been unchained from its sun. Now this is clearly something to do with the loss of values we can truly care about. And the philosopher Robert Pippin has interpreted the problem of nihilism as a problem of desire. More specifically, he tells us that it's a problem concerning desire's failure, the flickering out of some erotic flame, as Pippin puts it. There are said to be no prospects for reigniting this flame using Platonist or theistic resources. And the task ahead is said to be that of explaining how desire could be a self-sustaining creative force in the absence of those theistic or Platonist sustaining elements. As Pippin puts it, we want a picture of, of striving without the illusion of a determinate natural lack that we can fill. Now, striving and struggle are familiar from Taylor, and they're exemplified in Nietzsche's concept of the will to power, a vital ingredient in his solution to the problem of nihilism. The familiar question we face now, however, concerns how this striving is to be understood and sustained. I've denied that Platonism and theism are non-starters. And if my overall conclusions are justified, then it may be that these positions offer the best prospects for accommodating desire's creative force. These claims will be shocking and unsatisfactory to our atheist, but it must be remembered that I part company with the kind of atheist who situates value and God and spirituality in a far and inaccessible supernatural realm and who associates these things with lifelessness and nihilism. It remains open then that a framework along the lines I'm suggesting precisely can sustain the kind of unquenchable striving that is so important to Taylor and indeed our Nietzschean. As for the question of hell, I've denied that it's to be found in the theists or Platonists heaven, as Taylor thinks, at least as these notions are properly understood. And if the state of being in hell is to be identified with desire's extinction, then it's not ruled out that this is, it is the fate of Taylor's desiring subject and of course Nietzsche's nihilist. It remains to be seen whether these problems can be adequately or wholly addressed by revisiting the question of theism. But it seems to me that this is an avenue worth exploring further. And that is the end of the lecture. Um, thank you.